Well, I tell you, it's such a good place to be at Bel Air Baptist Church on any given Sunday morning. Such wonderful worship. I was uh, <clears throat> counting the instrumentalists, and uh, I first got transfixed with Dakota, teenager playing the guitar so masterfully, devoting her talents to the joy of the Lord. And then I got to looking at John Bowen, and I got to thinking, <clears throat> That right there is what God will do with you if you'll take whatever you got and give it to the Lord. Uh, seven years ago, when I became your pastor, John, uh, and I can say it now, I wouldn't say it then because I was hoping I was encouraging to him then, but he hit more sour notes than he hit good ones. <laughs> and I'm telling you, brother, he knocks it out of the park now. I mean, he's there. He's dead on. Amen. <laughs> So I guess what I'm trying to say, I appreciate our musicians. Uh, one was missing. Any given Sunday, when you come in here and this all looks so easy and so natural, uh, you got uh, nine, ten musicians up here. You got Alan's pulled that all together. And you know, when you're good at what you do, brother, Alan, you make it look easy. And we appreciate you. We appreciate that we can worship at Bel Air. And you contributed the most important part, and that's a spirit that wanted to worship God. So thank you. Thank you. If you haven't done so, turn to James chapter 2, verse 14. In a moment, we're going to start reading from there. Well, I put it off as long as I could, and it was time to go on a die. Y'all uh, slowly and surely over the last couple of years saw me just get bigger and bigger and bigger before your eyes. Well, I'm here to tell you that there's a little less of me today. This jacket fits better than it's fit in a long time. I'm not there, but boy, it was time to go on a diet. Uh, I, I, the song we sung, I, I, I hate to even tell you I'm on a diet because I kind of relate to that song, prone to wonder. God, I feel it. Prone to leave the diet I love. So y'all can pray for me. But I bring that up to point out that as Americans, we like things that are light, L-I-T-E, L-I-G-H-T. We like uh, salad dressing. That's light salad dressing. We like yogurt light. I love yogurt light. We, we like Coke, zero, Coke light. We like things because we want what we want, what we desire, but we don't want to pay the price for eating or drinking them. We don't want the heaviness, the calories that come with it. Now, that's a good thing, but it's not when it comes to religion. You see, unfortunately, as Americans, we tend to carry the same mindset to religion, to Christianity I'm talking about. We want to be accepted by God. We want to be saved from hell. But we want to do that by way of religion light. We don't want the heavy version, the calorific version of religion. See, we want salvation without the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen? We, we, we want heaven, but we don't want to shun the things of the world. And you know what? That is so popular, a mindset in our culture that we see idiots on TV pretending to preach the Word of God, and they're preaching before a, an auditorium of five, six, eight thousand people. Well, it's no big secret to me because most of them are giving them church light. They're giving them what they're asking for. They're giving us what we desire. We want religion. We want Christ without the heaviness. I tell you, some of them, they are to just go ahead and be honest. And on the marquee, they are to post the following ad. They are to entitle it, The Church Light, The Light Church. 24% fewer commitments. The home of the 2% tithe. 14-minute sermons, guaranteed. A total 45-minute worship service or you get your money back. Only eight commandments, your choice. And finally, everything you wanted in a church and less. That's church light in America today. And sadly, so sad, that's what a good bit of people are getting today in America. They're getting church light. They're, they're going to church, but there's no quickening of the conscience. They're going to church, and there's no feeding of the mind with the Word of God. They're going to church, but there's no opening of the heart towards God. There's no real faith involved in all that. 
And that is exactly, that is exactly what James wants to talk to us today in our text. James says, he wants you to know that first of all, there's nothing, as Solomon said, new under the sun. What's been tried has been tried. And, and church life, religion life, that's nothing new as it was back in James's day. So it is today. And there, there's always a tendency for human beings to want to just slide along in life with a bogus faith, with a disingenuous faith. Not a real faith. You see, a bogus faith makes no real difference in the way that you live. In today's text, James hopes to accomplish, I believe, two things. One thing, James wants to make it crystal clear what real faith is. He wants us to know what makes faith real faith. Because there is such a thing as false or bogus faith. Second thing he wants to do is he wants to establish the relationship between faith and works. Now listen, if ever there was a time when we need to have our eyes illuminated to the truth of God's Word, if ever there was a culture where we need to understand this mo momentous truth of what the relationship between faith and works is, it's the day and age in which we live. Because people err in both directions. There are those who say all you need is faith. You just need to uh, mentally assent to the truths of the gospel. There are those who want to bypass faith and go straight to works and work their ways to heaven. And James says, uh-uh. You better get it right or you must, might end up going down to the grave with a faith that's not genuine. So that's what we want to talk about today. Would you stand with me as we read James 14 through 19? We stand in the honor of reading of the Word of God. I remind you that because before this sermon's over, you're going to get mad at me. But don't get mad at me. Get mad at God. He's the one that said it. Yeah. Amen. Verse 14. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed, and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons, the demons also believe and shudder. Would you pray with me? Father, we pray now for the preaching of your word. Lord, may I be concise. May I be succinct. May I be clear. And Lord, if I get it right, I'll be simple. Because Father, you want everyone here to understand this message. And I pray by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, you would cause scales to fall from our eyes. That you would illuminate us today through the preaching of your word and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. For Father, without the work of the Holy Spirit here, nothing of eternal significance will be accomplished. But Father, if the Spirit moves... And if the people respond, Jesus will be glorified. And that's our heart's desire, that he be lifted up. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. I want to talk to you about this point in this text today. The point of the message being that our eyes need to be illuminated to the reality of real saving faith. We need illumination. We need enlightenment. Because we live in very confusing times. Times when people don't understand the difference between real faith and bogus faith and, and, and the relationship between faith and, and works. So I want us to look beginning in verse 14 and I want us to see first what James wants to do. James wants to provide illumination through two rhetorical questions. Point number one, 
Thank you. Illumination through two rhetorical questions. Notice what James begins this section of text. He says, first rhetorical question is, what, what use is it? Do you see it? What use is it? That's the question. What use is it, my brethren? If someone says he has faith, but he has no works, that is a rhetorical question. What use is it? The question is, what good is it? And then the second rhetorical question is, can that faith save him? Boy, that, that's what we need to know. Amen? I don't know about you. <clears throat> now, first of all, I don't gamble. But, and I hope no one here gambles. But if you gamble, you better be able to afford to lose. Amen? I've always thought that, you know. Uh, why would you gamble if you must win? If, if you, you're going to gamble, you better be able to afford to lose. Now listen, these people here today, you're willing to go to the grave and stand before God rolling the dice on whether or not you've got real faith. Woo! Is that a gamble you can afford to lose? I don't think so. I don't think I want to go down the grave wondering whether or not I'm saved. The Bible says you can know that you know that you know. I'm going to tell you right now, Randy Holmes is going to heaven. I know it. And four days over, maybe you'll know it. Amen? You see, that's not something you want to, you want to lose. So James wants to illuminate us by asking these two rhetorical questions. And he's wanting you to ask yourself. You remember, we already talked about how God's Word is looking in a mirror. Let's just look in this mirror today and let's see our own reflection and let's see what the Word of God reflects about my heart and your heart. Now, in the Greek text, it's clear that these two questions are questions that demand negative, a negative answer. The answer that's implied when James says, what you says it, and secondly, can that faith save him? The implied answer is, why, of course not. A duh, that's kind of what you're supposed to say. A duh, that's stupid. But yet, there's multitudes that are answering those questions in the affirmative. You know, at first glance, it almost seems that, let's just be honest today, because it's the elephant in the room that we just need to get out of the way. At first glance, it, it almost seems, James almost seems to be saying, seems to be saying that faith alone does not save. He, he, he says, down in verse 24, for example, look on down to 24, he seems, catch my word, seems to be saying it again in verse 24. He says, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Well, now that's the elephant in the room today. Because I have preached for decades that you are faith, saved by faith plus nothing else. Is James in contradiction with the Word of God? Well, let me tell you, then this is just proof that a great man of God like Martin Luther can be wrong. Martin Luther, in his preface to his uh, 1522 uh, edition of the New Testament, in the preface, Martin Luther said about the book of James that it was, quote, a strawy, S-T-R-A-W-Y, a, a strawy epistle. He found it hard to digest, Brother Bob, because Martin Luther was the champion in the Reformation for faith alone. And he had a hard time digesting the book of James. And all that proves is that even the great Martin Luther is not infallible that he, he can be wrong. Our, our confidence isn't in Martin Luther. It's in the Word of God. Now, a lot of people would think, will argue, that James's teaching here puts him in direct contradiction with the teaching of the Apostle Paul. Well, let's look at that for just a moment. See, the Paul argued that salvation came through faith alone. For example, Romans chapter 3, verse 27. Here's what Paul wrote. He said, where then is boasting? Is It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Justified. Remember that word. Now, he goes on, for example, and Tony read it. It's uncanny the way God pulls everything together, brother. He goes on to say in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, 
For by grace you have been saved and through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no man can boast. So what do we do with this? Is Paul and James in contradiction to each other? Because here's Paul unequivocally saying, and I unequivocally believe it, and are basing my salvation on it, that salvation is, hear me, by faith alone. Yeah, Period. Yeah. Plus nothing. Exclamation point. Exclamation point. Faith alone. But here's what you've got to see. There's no contradiction between James and Paul. There's no contradiction at all. Well, you've got to understand that Paul is teaching me and you. He's teaching and he's concerned about, he's focused on how to be saved. Do you hear me? Did you notice up, for example, Romans 3, he said we maintain that a man is justified. That is salvation language. That's being made right with God. That you are made right with God. You are justified by faith alone. That's what Paul is focusing on, how to get saved. And James, his concern and his teaching in the book of James is what do you do What's the evidence of the, whether you are saved? What, what do you do post-salvation? Y'all with me? If anybody's confused, raise your hand. We'll go over it again. See, James is pleading for the absolute necessity of works after salvation. You got that? After salvation, after coming to Christ, while Paul is pleading for the truth that works cannot save you, they cannot bring you to Christ, but James is teaching us that if you've come to Christ, works will naturally follow. So, notice through these two rhetorical questions, with that framework, James is confronting us today. He wants to illuminate our hearts with the challenge that if we've come to Christ, works are imperative. Works are uh, proof whether or not you're saved. It, it's a biblical truth like this. I'm not saved because of what I do. But I do what I do because I am saved. I could preach till the cows come home. I could preach till I fell off this stage. Watch it. I could preach till I starved to death, and that wouldn't save me a bit more than the man in the moon. But because I know Jesus, because I've been redeemed, because I've experienced His grace and His mercy, because my heart's been transformed, because I'm now enjoyed by the Holy Spirit, what a joy to work for Christ and preach His Word. That's what James is saying. I'm not saved because of what I do, but I do what I do because I'm saved. But notice secondly, not only does he want to illuminate us with two rhetorical questions, he now wants to illuminate us to a proper understanding through an illustration. Verse 15 through 17. Now here James introduces us to a brother or sister. This is a, a church, a fellow believer, a member of the congregation who is inadequately clothed against the elements. Not only that, this person is so destitute, they're hungry. They don't even have enough food to eat. Now here you are, this fictitious you, here you are, you're, you're warm and, and fat and having to go on a diet, and you've got a roof over your head, and God's blessed you with an abundance, and you come along this destitute brother or sister, and you say to them, look, I'm in your corner. Go be well. Be warm. Be fed. And in your piousness, your arrogant piousness, you have not the first inclination. You have not the first intention of doing not one thing, not even lifting your little finger to help that person. That's the illustration. Go well. Keep warm. 
and you say it and you don't do anything. Now, you listen, you would agree with me, would you not, in this illustration, that if that was me and you having that conversation, and you were the destitute one, and I was the one saying, go, you know, be well, be fed, you'd have to admit there'd be something seriously wrong with my sincerity. Amen? Something's wrong here. That, that's what James wants us to see. So, so notice what James does. He, he logically asks at the end of verse 16, I believe it is. Yeah. He asks the question. What use is that? What use is that? What good is it? Answer? No good at all. What a bummer if you're the destitute person. That's no good. What you're doing is outwardly dead and it's inwardly dead. It's absolutely no good. It's rotten to the core. So no notice in verse 17. I said this was an illustration. Verse 17 tells us that. Here, here's the point. Verse 17. Even so. Do you see that? Even so faith, if it has no works, is dead. Why? Being by itself. I guess we could say words are cheap. Amen? Words are cheap. Now it's interesting in the Greek text. This word that when he says in verse 17, using that illustration in the same way, faith without works is dead, the word being translated dead in the Greek is nekros. N-E-K-R-O-S. Nekros. It is the Greek word where we get the English word necrophilia from. Now we probably know what necrophilia is. It is an immoral, unhealthy fascination with the dead. And here's what James is saying. That, that by the way, is a very ugly word. That's an ugly word in the Greek that James is using it. And he's trying to shock us today to take in some inventory of our souls. That's what he's wanting. He wants you to say, you know what? Faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is necros. It is dead. Necros, an ugly thing. And it may be here today that, that you may have made a profession of faith. You may have been baptized. I don't know. You may have been raised in a whole convent of Christian people. You may be able to quote Scripture to me. The Bible says if that's all you got, you are necros. You're dead. That Satan, the great necromancer of the soul, may be your master instead of the Lord Jesus. Now, the point is obviously this, that profession in Christ requires action or it's not real. I remember in the, in the book of James, I want to say it's towards the end of the second chapter, that the Bible says that Jesus did, that, that a lot of people believed in him, but Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew the heart of every man. And even in the book of James, we see over and over, there's a faith that does not save. And, and, and think about John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, a forerunner of Christ, making the high hill lows, making the crooked way straight, preparing the way for the gospel. Here's what John the Baptist says in Luke chapter 3. John the Baptist, quote, says, he's preaching, and to set the stage, the religious crowd, Pharisees and whatnot, have been attracted to the crowd, and while he's preaching, he looks up and he sees them. And here's what he says. He says, So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, cut me some slack. I'm not standing up here calling y'all a bunch of brood of vipers today. But James just told it like it was. You brood of vipers, who is it that has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, here's what I want you to see. Therefore, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Do you see that? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that from these stones God's able to raise up children to Abraham. And indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the tree, so every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down 
and thrown into the fire. John the Baptist is saying exactly the same thing as James. If you claim to have come to repentance in Christ Jesus, and listen, that is the prerequisite for salvation. Yes, it's by faith, but as I come by faith, I come in repentance. That means I, 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 I reject the things of the world. I reject my sin. I'm turning from my sin. I'm genuinely giving everything to the Lord Jesus and by faith alone, relying on what He did on the cross, plus nothing, I plead my case for mercy before God. And James says, the Bible says, Paul says, John the Baptist says, Jesus says that that requires repentance. And John said, John the Baptist says, if you've done that, then how about producing some fruit in keeping with repentance? Same thing. James is not giving some off-the-wall new teaching here. John the Baptist's message said, you know what? Words are cheap. Words are cheap. If you're really coming to Christ, how about bearing some fruits that demonstrate it? Well, I couldn't tell you the time as a minister and, and probably you, if you've ever witnessed somebody have two, I can't tell you the time. Somebody I talked to. I used to pastor in Hancock County, Tennessee. It was a rural county and it had like 6,500 people in it and I lost count of the churches. 80, 90, 100 churches. I don't know. One down every holler. That's why you call them in Tennessee hollers church planning strategy there, Brother Bob, is if a family has a fallen out, you go build another church. You don't reconcile. You just start your own little congregation. But, but, but it, was, it was gospeled to death. And what I mean by gospeled to death, not that you can get too much of the true gospel, but they had preached a salvation by walking aisles and just praying a sinner's prayer. And I said one time, Pastor, and I'd love to meet one lost person in Hancock County. It didn't matter who I met because they are so acquainted with the mental facts of the gospel. They might be uh, living together with somebody they're not married to. They might both be on drugs. They may both be uh, in jail because they've been on drugs. They may be abusing their children. And I go make a visit and I say, do you know Jesus Christ? And they say, oh, yeah. I walked an aisle 20 years ago. And I was baptized 20 years ago, and my mom and daddy were Christians, and my daddy is a deacon, and I say, that's not what I asked you. John the Baptist's message is, how about some fruits that indicate you've come to Christ? You see, it's the inconsistency between what one claims to be and what one actually is that's turning the world off to the gospel. Do we understand that? Do you understand today that if people know that you claim to be a Christian and you're living like the devil or you're living like a lost person lives, they can't tell any difference on Monday between you and anybody else? Do you understand that's probably damning people to hell? Either be who you are or shut up. Either come to Christ or be honest and say I'm lost on the way to hell. Because the world's not turned off to Jesus. Jesus is still sweet. I don't care what you say. Jesus' arm ain't so short. Jesus is still saving. Jesus is still transforming lives. Jesus is still King of kings and Lord of lords. He's still the Alpha and Omega. What the world is turned off to is people claiming to come to Christ and not bearing fruits of repentance. So, if, if, if you're here today and you tend to talk about your faith in Christ, but you do nothing else, James is saying you're probably in spiritual trouble. And you need to be illuminated today. I want you to notice third. James also in verse 18 wants us to illuminate us through an uh, a, uh, imaginary objector. See, i probably got some in the crowd right now. you just being silent. Well, good. You made the sermon. James has now introduced you. If you're objecting to what you're hearing, James says in verse 18, uh, we'll, we'll name this guy Mr. Live and Let Live. Will that do? We'll just name this imaginary objector as Mr. Live and Let Live. So Mr. Live and Let Live in verse 18, 
But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. James says, here's this Mr. Live and Let Live. He'll say, oh, James, you've got your faith and I got my works. You can separate the two. One ain't got nothing to do with the other. James, you don't understand. I'm a member of Bel Air Baptist Church. James, you don't understand. I go to church almost every Sunday if football game's not on. James, you don't understand. You've got your faith. I've got my works. Or, more likely, they say the opposite. James, you don't understand. I've got faith. I believed. I walked an aisle. I was baptized. My daddy's a deacon. I believe that Jesus was the Christ. I believe he died. That's all I got. But James, you're, you're over here just working. And you can separate the two. You see, Mr. Live and Let Live, that's the crowd that's made a profession of faith. But nothing has changed in their lives. That, that's the crowd that, that, that's the, hanging their eternity. They're rolling the dice on eternity because of something, well, one-time event that they think has happened in their past. But years down the road, nothing has changed. They're still the same. Uh, you know, they, they don't think anything about living together with somebody they're not married to, yet they claim to know Jesus. They don't think a thing about going out and drinking with the boys, smoking a little marijuana. Marijuana, I know how to pronounce it. They, they don't think a thing about doing drugs or cursing or... or, or you know, looking at pornography on the internet. Fill in the blanks. The list is endless. And Mr. Live and Let Live says to James, you're wrong, James. You're absolutely wrong. You can separate faith from works. Do you see the, the uh, imaginary objector's argument? James is divine brother, half-brother, who happens to be the Lord Jesus Christ, had something to say about that. He spoke to that, let's say, in the parable of the souls. Remember the parable of the souls? There was four souls. There was a, a hard soul, a packed down soul. There was a rocky soul. There was a weed infested soul. And there was a good soul. Now Jesus said in Matthew 13, 23, in relation to the good soul, he said this, and the one on whom the seed, and Jesus also explained that the seed's the word of God. The one on which the seed or the word of God was sown on the good soil, this is the man who heard the word and understood it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. You see, the hard soil, the rocky soil, the weed infested soil yielded no fruit. And Jesus is concluding here by teaching us that the only true living faith that saves produces fruit. Well, I think that's what John the Baptist said. I think it's what James is saying. I think Jesus concluded the Sermon on the Mount with a stern warning about trying to separate faith from works. This is how he ends in Matthew 7. He said, You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorns, bushes, or figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit. Now we say there's not so good, not so bad. There's like 10 different varieties of trees. Jesus says, no, there's only two kinds of trees, good ones and bad. Every good tree bears good fruit and bad trees bear bad fruit. A good tree can not produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, here's the conclusion. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Now listen to me. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Is Jesus teaching us work salvation? Of course not. He's saying you'll know a tree by its fruit. And there's going to be a lot of people and if that ends up being you, you're not going to stand and condemn me as your preacher on that day. I'll have a clear conscience. Lord, I told them. 
But there's going to be people stand before God who have always said the right things and mentally assented to all the facts of the gospel, but nothing ever changed. There was no fruit. There was no transformation. There was no glorifying God in their post-after salvation life. And they are going to be shocked. Some of them are going to argue, the Lord says, didn't I preach in your name? That's a warning to me. Some are going to say, didn't I do miracles? Did, didn't I do this? Didn't I cast out demons in your name? And he's going to say, hey, depart from me. I do not know you. You see, saving faith, faith and works are like the, the wings of a bird. You ever seen a bird on the ground with a broken wing? What does it do? Hey, isn't that pretty close? He doesn't go anywhere. He just goes in a circle. Why? Because it takes two wings. If that bird's got two wings that are pumping together in concert, he's going to soar above the atmosphere. And I want you to see this today. That's the way faith and works are. They cannot be separated. When faith and works are flapping in concert together, the believer soars above the world. The believer soars upward and upward to Christ. There is no real salvation. There is no real life without faith and works pumping together. Now, faith is the only thing that will save you, but if you've been saved, there will be fruits in keeping with salvation, and that's where works come in, and you can flap both wings. Otherwise, you're going to make a false profession. I walked an aisle 20 years ago, but nothing has changed because you don't have works flapping with your wings of faith. Yes, well, as Forrest would say, that's all I've got to say about that. I do want to close with our last illumination. I want you to notice in verse 19 that James also wants to illuminate us through absurdity. Hang in here now. We're landing the plane. Illumination through absurdity. Verse 19. You believe that God is one. All right, let's take a test. Anybody here would raise your hand and say, I do not believe that there's a God. Anybody? Anybody here won't raise your hand and say, I don't believe that God is one? Anybody? All right, it's unanimous. Hey, you see what James says? You just did well. He said, you believe God's one? You do well. Only a fool believes otherwise. Amen? Only a fool, the Bible says, doesn't believe there's a God, the reality of God. But James wants to illuminate us through some absurdity here. He says, you believe God is one, you do well. Hey, the demons also believe and shudder. See, James concludes by taking us to the absurd. I want you to think with me a minute. There is not a demon in all of the universe that is an atheist. Can I hear an amen? amen. That's what the Word of God says. There is not one single demon who is an atheist. Oh, they may lie to you and try to convince you to be one, an atheist. They'll deceive you, but they, them, they themselves, they know there's a God. You know, demons are thoroughgoing monotheists. God's one. Not only that He exists, but He's one. He's just one God. Everything else, all these idols we get people to worship and all these things that the, we demons get them to bow down to, they're not real. There's not but one God. We're monotheists, says the demon. They believe God is one. And not only that, not only are they monotheists, they're Trinitarians. Demons are Trinitarians. They, they believe that the Apostles' Creed is true. Apostle Creed says God is the maker and Jesus is his virgin born son. Yeah. Demons believe that. Yeah. Hey, they know the truth of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. They know the truth of Jesus' ascension. They know the truth of his soon coming back again. 
They could quote you the Nicene Creed and agree with it. The Nicene Creed that says, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. Demons believe that. Demons are better theologians than a lot of Baptists are. And the Bible, James says, and they believe it, and what's the result? They shudder. They tremble. In the Greek, it literally, literally means they bristle up. It's like a scared cat all bristled up with his hair standing on end. When demons hear the name of God, they know he's real, and they shudder. And what is the point? That there is a belief that does not save. It don't matter if you agree with me or not. I'm in agreement with the Word of God. There is a belief that doesn't save. There's a belief that's not true faith. You see examples in the Scripture. Maybe James, whose divine half-brother was the Lord Jesus, has Judas in mind. I don't know. Judas professed to believe. He's in hell today according to the Word of God. There's example after example. Listen, hell is going to be full of the share of people who are monotheists, who are Trinitarian, who are Orthodox, who are Southern Baptists, who are on membership rolls and died lost without Christ. That's the point. And that's because real faith is more than mental assent to the truth. Real faith is a belief that involves the heart. Now when when the Bible says heart, it's not talking about the organ that pumps blood through your body. A little side comment real quick. Richie Allen spent some time with him yesterday, and he was telling me one of his pastors, a man had received one of the first heart plants over in Florida, and that he lost a deacon, a church member, because he refused to rebaptize that man because that deacon was convinced that man had to be resaved because he had a different heart now. He said, I couldn't convince him that that's not what the Bible's talking about. When the Bible says it's a heart thing, it means that you've got to not miss heaven by this distance. You've got to go from the head to the heart. The heart is who you are. It's everything you are. Listen, the Bible says in Romans 10 that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, I, I would say maybe that's the mental part. And you don't stop there. You believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. You will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses. See, a lot of people are trying to short-circuit salvation. They want to confess with the mouth and leave the heart out of it. They want church light. They want religion light. You know, it's one thing for me to say I believe an airplane can fly. It's another thing for me to get in that airplane and trust it and go somewhere. And brothers and sisters, that's giving your heart to Jesus. That means you've got to give Jesus everything. That you've got to be all in, holding nothing back. You give Him all that you are. I do believe you died on the cross. I do believe you bore my sin. I do believe you satisfied the wrath of God. I do believe you went to the tomb. I do believe you rose from the dead. I do believe that proves you're Lord and King and prophet and priest. That you're Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I give you my heart. I give you my life. I give you all I am. Just save me. That's salvation. So how do we reconcile faith and works? You know, the era people make, the unregenerate heart always wants to talk about works. Or it always wants to just talk about faith. The unregenerate crowd came to Jesus in John 6 and they said to Jesus, what shall we do? so that we may work the works of God. Isn't that what we want to know? Yes. As fallen sinners, I'll just tell me one thing. Just one thing and I'll do it and this thing will be settled. That's what the rich young ruler wanted to know. What one thing? What work can I do? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Listen, this is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. That's the only work God wants out of you today if you're not saved. There's one work above all works that must begin. 
And that is if the Holy Spirit's convicting you right now and you know you're lost, I don't care if you're on a church roll or not. I don't care if you're a member here or not. I don't care what your heritage is or not. But if the Holy Spirit's convicting you right now, God is saying to you, there's only one thing I demand of you right now, and that's to believe on Him through faith who died for you. Because there's really no such thing as church light. There, there really is no such thing as getting your get out of hell free card and Jesus not being Lord and Savior. And a church that waters down the gospel, I'm here to tell you today, church light is no church at all. It's an imitation of the church. A real faith is committed to Jesus wholeheartedly. A real faith comes to the cross on God's terms and not our terms. Alan's coming and the minister is going to come forward. I'm going to pray with you. And this is a time that unless your house is on fire, I'd personally appreciate it if you'd be still. That this is a serious moment. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is doing right now in your heart and life. And I'm not going to pretend I do. But I know in the power of the Holy Spirit when the Word of God has been preached. And right now, God's saying to you something. And the only question you got to do is, will I believe? Will I submit? Will I give Him everything? So I'm going to pray for you. If you're here today and you're lost, I struggle sometimes about saying whether or not to come forward because that work of walking an aisle won't save you. But if you have believed, it, it, it's good because it just kind of drives a stake in the ground and settles it. But you can be saved right where you're at. You can be saved at home. You can call me tomorrow and I'll meet you or you can come to my office and we'll talk. But if God's dealing with you, I beg you, don't you rest until you get this settled. You need to be saved. And the Holy Spirit's telling you that right now. If you're ready right now, if you're ready to go all in, believing in Jesus, then you can pray right where you're at. You can pray something like, you know, Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I know you died for me on the cross and I'm trusting in what you did and nothing else. Forgive me and save me. And Lord, if you'll just do that, the best I can, I'll make you Lord of my life and he'll give you the Holy Spirit and then you'll start to work and work and work and work. As a result, you can leave here knowing God. If you need to join the church or anything else, we're here to receive you. The altar's open if you need to pray. Let's pray and we'll respond. Father, we just pray for the sanctity of this moment. It is a holy moment when men and women, boys and girls, have been confronted with the Word of God and now they're under the wooing of the Holy Spirit. Let none of us hinder your work and may you give the courage to everyone here to immediately obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you stand? Would you respond?